before him and just to declare his holiness and know that we are invited into his presence. What an incredible privilege we have with God. Before we jump into the message this morning, I want to mention next week, uh, Jeannie and I will be gone. We're going to the International Baptist Convention's annual Ministry Leadership Conference. Man, that was a huge title right there. But we'll be gone next Sunday. Richard, sorry, he was in here just a minute ago, had the welcome packets in his hand. He'll be bringing the message next week, which, which actually might be his last time preaching here before they move back to the States and he enters the formal roles of the retired from the Air Force. But you come next week and hear what the Lord lays on Richard's heart. He has been such a blessing to this church over the years. He and Marie have served here. Um, and I'm sad. I, might, I have not, never actually heard him preach in person. I've watched several recordings of his messages, and I know you will be blessed by him next week. Well, this morning we are wrapping up our series on building our families on God's foundation. And we're going to end this morning with, I think, is one of the most critical issues in our home, and that is the issue of prayer. Dr. Fred White was a longtime professor at Dallas Baptist University. He once said this. He said, I don't claim to understand everything there is to know about prayer but I believe in it, and I practice it, and it works. And over the last eight weeks, we've been looking at our homes and, the, and really the, the ministerial aspect of our homes. Our homes are a ministry field, and for those of us who are married and have children, our very first and foremost ministry field, and we've been looking at it from that perspective. One of the aspects of ministry in the home is to present God to our children. So that they come to see who he is, either through his word, and we've talked about even through the teaching of his word and modeling of his word, and the importance of that aspect of our ministry in the home. Even the relationship, how God designed marriage between a husband and a wife is designed as this complementary relationship. So that between the two of you, the two, between the two parents, you, we're revealing and putting on display the different aspects of God's characteristics. And even the marriage relationship itself, as we look there in Ephesians chapter 5, is designed to serve as sort of a, a living, breathing example in front of our children, in front of the world, of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. God has given us that privilege in our homes of presenting God to our children. That's one of the critical aspects of ministry within the home. But the other aspect is presenting our children to God. And we do that primarily through the ministry of prayer. And this morning I want us to look in Matthew chapter 6. If you've got your Bibles there, turn there with me to Matthew 6. To what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. Now as you're turning there, let me just mention this. I, I think that it's maybe more apt to not so much refer to this as the Lord's Prayer. That's sort of the traditional title we have attached to it. But to refer to it as the model prayer. Because really, as, as we look through it, and many of us know it, we can recite it from memory. We've heard it enough times, we maybe even recited it in church. But what Jesus, he begins, he says, pray in this way. And he's not so much giving us a script necessarily to follow as he is giving us a model. Here's what a powerful and effective prayer life looks like. Here's some of the elements that if you have these as, as natural elements of your prayer life, you will have a powerful and effective prayer prayer life. He's given us a model for prayer. Now, I know as we've gone through this sermon series, there may have been times, points along the way, when you might have said, this piece or that part doesn't really apply to me in my current situation. Maybe you're single, and we got to that part where we're talking about marital relationships between a husband and a wife, and what a godly husband is, or what a godly wife is, and you say, well, I'm single. I'm not really sure that necessarily applies to me. I can, I can kind of disregard or tune that out a little bit for right now. That's for down the road for me. Or maybe you're married and you don't yet have any children. And you say, well, that's, that's good information to know about how to be godly parents, but that's down the road. That's not so much relevant for us today. But I'm reminded that many of us are somehow affiliated with the military. And the way the, the military handles matters, I think, particularly our training, is something that's important for us to look at with these issues, too. When you are in the military, the time to train for the battle is not when you're in the battle, right? When, you, when you're sent to charge the hill, we're not really, we don't do that in the Air Force, but theoretically, you're sent to go out into battle, that's not the time to think, you know, I probably should have figured out how to fire this weapon. I probably should have learned that before now. I probably should learn some of these skills I'll need in battle. You're, the time to think about those is not as you're charging in 
to battle. The time to think about those is before, right? To spend time training and getting good at those skills and attitudes and habits before those times come. That's why there was an exercise at the base a couple weeks ago, right? As much of a pain in the neck as those things are. Remember when I was in uniform? There are things I miss about being active duty. There are things I don't miss. That's one of them I don't miss. But there's a reason for those, right? You train before you get into the heat of battle so that those skills are second nature. Maybe you're single and going through this series, you're saying, I'm not sure where this fits. But are you developing the skills and the habits and the attitudes of being a godly man or a godly woman so that when you, be, when you do get married, these are second nature to you? Maybe you don't have children. But are you developing the godly habits and attitudes of godly parents so that one day if God blesses you with children, these things are second nature to you? And so I do pray that God has used these, these instructions over these last several weeks. Many of them are, the videos are recorded. They're up on our Aviano Baptist Church, fa or not Facebook, YouTube channel. You can link that through our website if you don't know where it is. Just go down to the bottom on the sermons. On the top line link, there's, you can find the sermons, find previous ones. It'll take you to our YouTube channel where you can find them. Many of them are there. We've had some gremlins back there. In the booth, as always happens in the AV booth, there's gremlins that creep in there. So many of these sermons are online if you want to go back and review them again. But there's, there's this critical matter of prayer in our homes. And let me just say this. If you have been married for a while, you have children, and maybe you haven't implemented some of these godly principles, and you well, this is new. Is it too late for me to implement these things? My kids are a little bit older now. We've been married a few years. It is never, ever too late to implement the Word of God to introduce that into your lives and to implement godly principles into your home. And this morning, I want us to talk about this crucial matter of prayer in the home, the crucial matter of the role that prayer plays, the power of prayer in the godly home. Now, as you look at this Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, it breaks down naturally, I think, into two sort of sections, two chunks. The first section, verses 9 and 10, deals with spiritual matters in prayer. The second chunk, verses 11 through 13, deals with more physical matters in prayer. That's the way it kind of naturally breaks down. That's how I want us to look at it this morning. Those two aspects, the spiritual matters in prayer that Jesus teaches us about, and then the physical matters in prayer. First, verses 9 and 10, the spiritual matters in prayer. Jesus said this, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. There is a spiritual aspect of our prayer life. In fact, Oswald Chambers said in his classic devotion, My Utmost for His Highest, I'm doing a blog on that every day, and if you are connected to our Facebook group, you're probably getting spammed every day with my notes as I post those out there. But, but he, in his classic devotion, My Utmost for His Highest, he said this. He said in prayer, what we're more focused on is getting a hold of God rather than getting a hold of the answer. There is a spiritual component to prayer that is far more primary, far more important than the physical aspect of it. But the first thing I want us to notice here is that prayer is a learned skill. Some of us are natural in, in the way we can connect. We connect with God in prayer in a way that just sort of flows naturally out of us. But there are others that have to learn this skill. Prayer is a learned skill. Whether it comes natural to you or not, you can learn to have an effective prayer life. This text, the Lord's Prayer as we commonly call it, is, is recorded twice in the Gospels. Once right here in, in Matthew chapter 6. This is right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 through 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Happens at the early times of his earthly ministry. He has just chosen his disciples and then he comes into this long sermon, a public teaching of his in the Sermon on the Mount. And in the midst of that, right in the middle of that, he gives us instruction on prayer. It happens again in Luke chapter 11. It's recorded there. That's much later in Jesus' earthly ministry, maybe even during the last year of his earthly ministry. And there in Luke chapter 11, it's in response to a request by the disciples. They say, Lord, teach us to pray, just like John taught his disciples. And there's something telling in that for us. Prayer can be a learned skill and we have the privilege of not only learning how to do it well 
But if you have children, or one day you will have children, we have the privilege of teaching others, the next generation of believers, modeling it for them and teaching it to them so that they too can have an effective prayer life. Because as parents, children learn a great deal about prayer from you. They watch you. They see kids pick up on all manner of things that you don't think they pick up on. And I think I said this a couple weeks ago, when it comes to children, sometimes more is caught than is taught. They pick up on things. They learn a great deal about prayer from you and watching your prayer life. For example, they learn what to pray for from you. They watch you, and the only time we come to pray, the only time I see my parents come to prayer is when we're in a crisis. When the world is falling apart, when we come to the end of our rope and we don't know what else to do, that's when I see my parents come to prayer. And what kids pick up from that is that's when we pray. When, when we have exhausted everything that we can do, and we've come to the end of our rope, we have no more answers, that's the time that we pray. They learn what to pray for. They learn what, pre- what place prayer ought to have in your life. They learn whether, God, whether we believe that God is interested in what is going on in our lives or whether we think he is just interested in the big things or the big matters, whether we think that we're bothering God or not. They learn all of those things about prayer by watching us as parents. And so there are spiritual lessons here in prayer that are important for us to, to pull out of this text, not only for our own personal prayer lives, but for our prayer lives as parents. First thing I think that Jesus points out, though, is that our prayer life is a reflection of how we, how we view our relationship with God. Look at the first couple of words of that. He says, pray then in this way, our Father. There's something significant about that. The way we can address God in prayer is significant. Our Father. The scripture says that as believers, we are united with Christ. We are co-heirs with him of the kingdom. That we are now sons in the household. We're no longer servants, no longer slaves. We're sons in the household. If you have a relationship with Christ, you have the privilege, just like Jesus, of, of referring to God the Father as father and all of the implications that go along with that think about what those are god is a is a good father and just like any of you who have children or good fathers you want what is best for your children we can expect that when we when we recognize god as our father that he wants what is best for us he may not always give us what we want but he will always give us what is best like any good father He's not unwilling to hear our requests. We're not dragging an an obstinate God into our circumstances. We're not trying to convince him to get involved. He's not unwilling. He's not plugged his ears. He wants to hear our requests. He wants to respond to the matters in our lives. And we're not bothering God when we come to him. As any good earthly father, we don't feel bothered when our children come to us and say, Daddy, would you do this? Daddy, can we do this together? Daddy, would you spend time? That doesn't bother us as a father. It doesn't bother God. I think very often we have this idea that I'm not going to bring this matter to God because it's not big enough. God's got enough things to worry about running the universe. He doesn't need to worry about this insignificant matter in my life. But God is our father in heaven he's not bothered when we come to him with matters when we bring issues to him he wants to know the command of scripture is pray without ceasing always be in an attitude of prayer in connection with our heavenly father he wants to know what's on your heart if it if it's significant to you it's significant to him he wants to hear about it that's god is our heavenly father like any good father sometimes he'll say no we don't like to hear that Right? We don't like to think about the fact that I might pray for something and God might say no. It makes me just a little bit uncomfortable when I hear people say, you know, I prayed for this, but God didn't answer my prayer. Yes, he did. The answer was no. Or the answer was, wait. We don't like to think that God might answer our prayers that way. But like any good father, sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is, wait, we will do that later. And like any good father, he's not just there to give us stuff. He's not our our heavenly ATM machine and and prayer is the card that we plug in and hit our pin number and ching, 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 things come out. God is not a heavenly ATM machine. He's not just there to give us things or pour out blessings in our lives, although he wants to do that. There is a relational aspect about prayer. 
And how you pray says a, a great deal about what you believe about God. How you approach him in prayer says a great deal about what you believe about him. And listen, if you have a hard time praying to God as Father, recognizing him as, as, as your heavenly Father, your Abba Father, Daddy, Papa, if you have a hard time recognizing God that way, maybe the place to begin is asking the question, is he my heavenly Father? Have I trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior? Can I call him Papa, Abba? Can I consider myself a co-heir with Christ? Maybe if you have a hard time recognizing God as a loving Father in your life, maybe that's the place to begin. Maybe he is not yet. Because there is a, a relational aspect that says a great deal about what we believe about God is revealed in how we pray to him and how we approach him. And notice the first thing that Jesus shows us to ask for in prayer. Last half of verse 9. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now I want to point something out about those statements. None of those statements are statements. They're requests. Every one of them is a request. It's not an exclamation of this is how it is. It's a request that says this is how I want it to be. Hallowed be your name. I want your name to be honored. I want your name to be exalted. Lord, would you enable me to do that? I want to give you the place of honor in my life and in my home. Your name represents who you are. When people talk about you and, and they mention your name, it causes other people to think about your reputation, your character, what you're like. That's what your name represents. That's what God's name represents who he is what he is like his character his reputation and our prayer there when we're saying lord would your name be hallowed is god in my life and then subsequently in my family when people see me or they see my family would they think about your name would they think about your reputation and your character would you be revealed in us? That is an incredible prayer. And then next, Jesus says this. This may be even a more powerful prayer than the first one. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Right here, just like it is in heaven. How is God's will carried out in heaven? Is there a time in heaven when the angels hear the, the command of God and they say, you know, God, maybe we ought to rethink that. Do you really think that's a, a good idea, God? Is there a time when that gets right? No. Is there a time when that conversation might happen? Is there a time when the angels would say, you know, God, I'm not, I'm not arguing that's a good idea, that I probably ought to do that, but I'm going to do that later. Is there ever a time in heaven when that happens? God's will in heaven is carried out, always, is carried out immediately in heaven without question, without pushback that's what we're praying for it's a statement of god's authority in our lives that lord i am getting out of the way brian prayed earlier that we'd get out of the way that, lord i'm getting out of the way and i'm going to stop trying to crawl back on the throne of my life and take control i'm giving you the place of authority in my home who's the authority in your home you might say, well, over the last several weeks, we've been talking about the, that parents are the ones that God has placed in a position of authority in the home. So I am. I'm the authority in my home. I'm the father. I'm the mother. We're the authority in our home. But who really is the authority in your home? Who influences your decisions? Whose advice do you follow when it comes to determining what is right or wrong for your home and for your family? Who helps you determine what your family will do or what your family will not do? Whose advice do you look for? Who is influencing your decisions about what your family will and will not be involved in? Is it the advice of your friends? Are you looking at other families, other couples, other parents and saying, well, they're doing it that way, so maybe we ought to try that in our home. Now, that's good. God often puts godly examples in front of us, and we ought to look at them and say, they've really got something they're really following the Lord in their home, and I really think that we could model that. There's something good about that. Is it your family that is your primary influence? 
You say, well, this is the way our house is set up because this is the way my parents did it. I don't know any other way. This is the way we do it because it's the way they did it. And they did it because that was the way their parents did it. Again, very often we have godly parents we can look to and say, that's a good model to follow after. But is that your primary influence? Is it the things you read or hear? Is Dr. Phil your main influence? Well, Dr. Phil said we ought to do it this way at home. Or Oprah said we ought to do that. Or Dear Abby said that this was important. Is it things you read or hear? Because here's the, here's the issue. What influences your decisions the most is the authority in your home. Whatever has the most influence over those decisions, what your family will and won't do, what is right and wrong, what is good and bad in your home, whatever influences those decisions the most is the authority in your home. You've heard it said, the old adage, that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? Who you're imitating is who you're exalting. And in this prayer, when I'm saying your will be done, your kingdom come here like it is there, what I'm saying is, God, I'm giving you the authority. I'm relinquishing the reins and acknowledging you as the primary authority in my home. That's a powerful prayer. Lord, I want you and your word to determine right and wrong here. I want what exalts you and brings glory to your name to be the things, the criteria that we use to make those decisions in our home. And when it comes to prayer, teaching us how then we ought to pray, how should we structure our prayer, what are the elements of a, a powerful prayer life, Jesus begins with these spiritual matters, us connecting to, with God on a heart level. And demonstrate the place that God has in your life and home through prayer. Demonstrate the importance, not only in your own life, but others that are in your circle of influence, but what about your children? Demonstrate to your children the importance the place that God has in your life through prayer. And pray for his help to submit and surrender your home and your authority to him, to allow him to be the one that is in the place of authority. And then pray that your family would exalt his name. Jesus begins with spiritual matters. He doesn't neglect the physical matters. There is a physical element of prayer. He invites us, once again, Paul invites us in Philippians 4 to make our requests be known. There is a physical element. There are physical matters to deal with in prayer. Verses 11 through 13. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we, as all, we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let me just mention that last phrase in verse 13. And somebody come to me after the first service and, and they said, you know, my Bible doesn't have that phrase in it. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Um, and I said, what, what translation? She she got a new Ameri or NIV. But it's in a footnote in the bottom. And that phrase is not, if you have King James, that phrase is probably not in there. That was a phrase that was picked up in later manuscripts. And the, and the translator said, there it is, but we're not quite sure what to do with that. Was that in the originals or not? So they often will put it as a footnote, that last phrase there in verse 13. But as Jesus turns his attention to physical matters, I think there's something that's obvious, but I think there's, it bears pointing out just the same. There is nothing wrong to pray for what we need. There is nothing wrong to pray for what we want. As I mentioned, Paul invites us to do that. Make your request be known to God. We are invited to bring our requests to God. But notice it, where it lies within this model prayer that Jesus gives us. It is not the first matter that we deal with. It is not the matter of first importance to say, Lord, here's the stuff that I need or here's the stuff that I want. It is not the matter of first importance. And notice also it is not of majority importance. It isn't the thing that Jesus spends most of his time talking about, the things that I want or the things that I need in my life. He does mention it is a, a critical part of our connecting with the Lord, but it isn't the first matter and it isn't a majority matter. His overarching message here is that prayer is relational rather than transactional. We're not necessarily looking for the answer. We are looking to connect and get a hold of God. It is a, it is a relational matter, not so much a transactional matter. But even praying for the physical matters, even this physical element of prayer teaches us something important about God. The first is a reminder, verse 11, that everything that we have, 
Everything that we have ever received is from the hand of God. Every nickel in your bank account, every can of corn in your pantry at home, every pair of clothes you've got hanging in the closet, every single thing ultimately comes from the hand of God. James said every good and perfect gift comes from above. And praying that way, Lord, give us this day our daily bread as a reminder of that. It's an acknowledgement of that. God, I see that. I see your wonderful hand as provider. I see your wonderful hand as, as a God who wants to make sure I have what I need in life. It's an acknowledgement of God as the provider in your life. If you don't already do this, let me encourage this. Make just this simple matter of you and your family saying a prayer of thanksgiving before every meal. Make that a habit in your home if you don't already do that. that. That shows your children. First of all, it shows you that you recognize this fact. That even just this, and it's for sure once a day, but maybe three times a day. A reminder to you that I recognize this fact. That God is the provider of everything I've got. It's a reminder to your children as well. On a regular basis, a daily basis, sometimes several times a day. That God is our provider and everything that we have and receive comes from him. And then in verse 12. Verse 12, he points out the connection between forgiveness in our lives and our ability to connect and worship God properly. Back in chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus is talking about someone who, who comes to the altar and he's got a gift to present. Now that's a, a moment of worship. That person has come to the altar. They've come to have a time of worship with God. And he says, now, if you get there, and you've got your gift to present, you get there and then you remember when you get to the altar, you know what, I've got something between my brother. There is some matter that is unreconciled between us, maybe even a matter that is unforgiven between us. He said, leave your gift, go back and be reconciled, and then come back. There is an importance of forgiveness in, in how we can relate to God, how we can worship Him properly. Listen, we're praying that, Lord, Your name would be exalted in my home, that in my life and in my family, everything that we do and say would glorify Your name. Can we really do that? Can we really exalt His name? Can we really worship Him in spirit and in truth if we're harboring a spirit of unforgiveness? If we're carrying that around and saying, that person did that to me, and Lord, I will gladly receive your forgiveness, but I'm not going to give it to them. Can we worship him in spirit and truth? Can we truly say that we are asking, Lord, your name be exalted in my life? If we're carrying that unforgiveness around. And we find that having a healthy prayer life enables us to resolve conflict. Now, if you've been married more than a day, if you certainly have any children, you know that conflict happens in your home. I know, collective gasp. <gasps> Not in my home, it doesn't. Conflict will happen in your home. But I think what we find is a healthy prayer life enables us to work through those. Look at, again, what we're asking for, really, in verse 12. I grew up in a tradition. I was, I was Lutheran when I was a kid. We said this prayer every week. And one of the things, maybe the downside to that, is I lost sight of what we're really saying. Look again at what we're asking for in verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You know what we're asking God to do? Lord, I want you to pour out your forgiveness in my life to the extent that I'm willing to offer it to someone else. I'm going to let my, my limits, on the, the limits that I put on forgiveness, Lord, I'm putting them on yours into my life. I'm going to ask you to forgive me, but only to the extent that I will be willing to forgive someone else. Listen, you can't pray that way with unforgiveness in your heart. You can't come before God and reasonably ask that with unforgiveness in your heart. And when we pursue forgiveness in prayer, it enables us, it forces us almost to work through conflict, to offer forgiveness, to make that a critical part of our lives. Because prayer is how we turn those conflicts over to God. Prayer is how we invite him into the middle of them. Peter said, cast your cares upon God because he cares for you. He did not say that God's going to force his way into the middle of your concerns. That God's going to force his way into the middle of your conflicts. He said, cast them over to him. Give them 
to him, invite him into them. And again, Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 that when we bring our request to God, when we do that, that, that the time in prayer eases anxiety in our lives. It is prayer that opens the door for that peace that passes understanding. Whether our circumstances change or not, it is prayer that opens that door. That's what enables us to, to turn those conflicts over to God. Because Jean and I have been married for a long time. And I have counseled with many couples throughout the years. I've discovered that the three hardest words for spouses to utter are this. I forgive you. The three hardest words, I think, for spouses to utter are I forgive you. But it's that that opens the door for reconciliation. Bringing forgiveness in enables us to let go of those past hurts and not carry them and not allow them to take hold and become bitterness and resentment. It's forgiveness that sets us free of those things. And what a powerful testimony it is. Not only in your own life, not only to others who might be watching you, but what a powerful testimony it is to your children. When they see that forgiveness is not just something we talk about when we're at church, not just something we talk about in Sunday school or during our Bible time. Forgiveness is real. I've seen my parents asking for it. I've seen my parents freely offering it. Forgiveness is real. What a powerful testimony that is. And then verse 13. He says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We talked a couple weeks ago about the importance of parents taking the role as the gatekeeper in your home. You be the one to determine what comes into your home. What temptations are you going to open the door to in your home, in your life, and in the lives of your children? Parents, we have to be the gatekeeper. God won't bring temptations. That's not what Jesus is saying. James tells us that's not God's game. No temptation comes from God. God does not tempt us. That's, the, that's a play of the enemy to bring temptation into our lives. God doesn't bring temptation. The prayer is this. Lord, you have promised in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that you will provide a way of escape. You will provide the means that I can, I can flee from this temptation. And here's his prayer here. Lord, help me to see that. When that temptation comes up, help me to see that way of escape that you have offered for me. And help me not only see it, but help me to take it. And once again, you might say, well, you know, we're doing okay. Our home, we're, we're doing okay like we are. And I don't, I don't argue that prayer is important. That's probably something we ought to do more often. But I think we're doing okay right now. And you know what? We really don't have time to, to put prayer into our schedule anyway. We're so busy doing other stuff. I'm, I'm not just not sure where we would put it in. We can wait. We can put that off until later. And one day, then, we'll pursue prayer as a matter of regularity in our home. You know, I think Peter thought the same thing. Peter thought he was too strong to fail. Peter thought he could put off those matters of prayer. I think in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter made that bold proclamation to Jesus, I will never deny you. We know how that story turns out. Within just a few short hours, what is Peter doing? The very thing he boldly proclaimed, I will never do. Peter thought he was too strong. Peter thought, you know what? Hey, that's not a bad idea, Jesus. Jesus warned them in the Garden of Gethsemane, watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. And I'm certain Peter looked at that and said, that's not a bad idea, Jesus. I'll do that one day, but I'm doing okay right now. I'm strong. I got this. We can't put off this matter of, of the criticality of prayer in our homes. This is not a matter we can say one day this will be important today. This is important. The time to prepare once again for battle is not when the bullets are flying, not when you're in the midst of battle. That's not the time to, pre to prepare for battle. The time to prepare is before you hit the battlefield. Make this a matter of importance in your home. Let me leave you this morning with a couple of tips. A few things to see. If you don't have a, a regular prayer time in your own life, and have a regular prayer time in your family. What are some things you can do that when you leave today, this is not just a good idea, something you could start doing today. What are a few tips to get started? First is this. Decide the best way to do it in your home. 
you're going to see a lot of people and you'll interact with couples and you'll interact with families and they have a lot of ways they do it in their home. Glean what you can from that. That's important to see how other people have made this work. Glean what you can from other people. Some people like to pray in the morning. I'm a morning prayer. I'm a morning everything. I love getting up early and getting stuff done. I'm a morning person. Yes, I am that annoying guy who's up in the morning ready to go. Some people like to pray in the morning. Some people like to do that in the afternoon. Some people like to have a, a corporate time of family prayer, sort of a family altar, so to speak. Some people like to pray individually and to spend time with each of the children as they put them to bed. The important thing is not how you do it, but that you do it. Find what works for your family. Find what works in your home. That's what you need to be looking for. Second, let me give you an encouragement to teach your kids and to maybe practice this in your own life, the Acts prayer model. That's not Acts like chop down a tree. That's Acts like the book of Acts, A-C-T-S. I had somebody tell me after the service, this would be, the, the model of this should be better, CATS, C-A-T-S. What the letters stand for is this, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Model your own prayer life that way. Teach that to your children. That helps us pray like Jesus taught us to pray here. It keeps us focused on the critical elements of prayer, worship and confession and seeking forgiveness, thanking him for his provision before we bring requests to him. It helps us focus on how Jesus taught us to pray. It keeps our prayer life from becoming too me-focused. There is a fantastic article about this on Focus on the Family's website. The article is called Make Prayer Real. And they talk about not only the importance of praying this way, but how to teach it to your children, even young children. Make prayer real on focusonthefamily.org. It's a great article on how to do that. Pray the Acts model. Don't overcomplicate this. Prayer doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be difficult. Now, I realize you might say, you know what, Pastor, you just spent the last... 30 minutes talking about the spiritual aspect and, the, and all this theological goodness about prayer. And then you're talking about this Acts prayer model. And then on the heels of that, you say, yeah, but don't make this too complicated. But don't. Don't complicate, overcomplicate prayer. I think the reason, one of the reasons Jesus gave this, if you look at the whole context of, of Matthew chapter 6, one of the reasons that Jesus gave this was to teach us that God is not impressed by our beautifully worded prayers. God is not the least bit interested in that our prayers sound religious or we have all the right things to say. In fact, he says up in verse 5, the, the hypocrites pray that way and they've already gotten their reward. God is not moved by those beautifully worded prayers. That's not what connects with his heart. Your spouse is the same way, right? You could bring home a, a Hallmark card and inside that card are maybe a hundred of the most beautifully, the most beautifully worded poem you've ever seen. And you could read that to your spouse, and if you don't mean one of those words, they're not all that interested. They're not all that impressed with a hundred beautifully sounded, beautifully crafted words that you don't mean. They'd rather hear three words that you do mean. Three words that are from the heart than a hundred that you don't. And God is exactly the same way. He's not that interested in how religious our prayers sound. He's interested in connecting with our hearts. Don't overcomplicate prayer. And the last thing I want to mention is this, to steal the quote from Nike, just do it. Just do it. We, we could argue about, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure where I'll find the time. I don't know how we're going to get this started. I don't really know what to do. But don't overcomplicate this and just do it. We can put off until tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and one day and then 10 years down the road we realize I never really did start a prayer life in my own life or in my home. And so to steal that quote from Nike, just do it. Let me end our time together this morning with two quotes. The first is from theologian E.M. Bounds. He said this. He said, prayer is timeless. It long outlives the life of the one who prays. We're talking about building legacies in our home, right? Building a godly legacy that far outlasts education, that far outlasts uh, athletic ability, that far outlasts any uh, kind of achievement we'll have in this life. How do we begin to build a legacy in our home? Prayer long outlives the life of the one who prays it. Second quote is from Ruth Bell Graham. She is the late widow of now the late Reverend Billy Graham. She said, I seriously doubt if there would be as many divorces among Christians 
Or I seriously doubt there would be the breakdown of the Christian home, for that matter, if more couples took the time to pray for each other and for their families. This is a critical matter. We are not waiting to enter the battlefield. We are smack in the middle of it. A a battle for our home and a battle for our families. And the time is now for us to make prayer a critical, important matter in our homes. Do you want to transform your families? Transform them beyond the, what they could achieve in this world and transform them for, for God's goodness. Do you want to transform your families? Create a, a lasting, godly legacy that they will go further in their walk than God has taken you in yours. Do you want to create that legacy in your family? That begins when we unleash the power of prayer in our homes. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, what a joy and a privilege that it is to be able to approach you in prayer and to recognize, Father, that you are our Father. You love us like a great Father. You're interested in what's going on in our lives like a great Father. There is no matter in our lives that you don't want to hear about. That You would say, that's not important enough to bring to me. You are always there for us. You are such a good God and such a a gracious provider. Father, as we enter these moments of invitation, Lord, many times we neglect this wonderful privilege that we have of prayer, connecting with you on a heart level. And Father, as we enter this time of invitation, Father, I pray that your spirit would continue to convict our hearts singles and married couples and parents if we've neglected this aspect of prayer in our homes. Father, help us to come to you in repentance, to come to you for forgiveness and restoration, and help us to implement this into our homes, to to create a a prayer environment. Father, maybe there's one here this morning that can't pray to you as Father because they were honest with themselves, you're not their father in heaven. They've never repented, never trusted in Christ. Father, I pray these moments of invitation are for them as well. You'd help them to step out, to just make their way to the front and say, I need to know Jesus. Father, how you continue to move in these next few moments, you continue to speak to our hearts, help us to respond to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our hymn of invitation? However, God is speaking to you, whether it's concerning your relationship with Him, concerning a matter of prayer. Maybe you need to come to this altar in repentance or pray right where you are. You want someone to pray with you and encourage you. Let these few moments be the time for